Thank you for coming. Jochen Bauer, I'm Lord. Thank you very much for being once more in the green room in Podcore, where we will be partly celebrating the launch of the new issue of Poetry Wales, which is the last edition edited by Jonathan Edwards. Uh, we're going to do or perform a, a special reading, live streamed and Zoomed of one or the part of one essay, uh, Sand and Salt, composed by Zoe Brigley, Christian Evans, and myself, Robert Minhinick. I'm going to start, and uh, Christian and Zoe will continue with excerpts from the essay. And we also have two guest readers, um, Laura Wainwright, and possibly Jerry Ray. Also, we've got a special treat. Paul Woodford of Sustainable Wales will be showing two films. There will be no interval. It'll be all straight through. So the readers will be myself, Christian, Zoe, Laura, and possibly Jerry Ray, Paul Woodford, and then we'll do it again. The essay, Sand and Salt, was really the idea of, of Zoe Wrigley. I, I think we discussed it vaguely uh, a year and a half ago in the pub, The Angel, in Maudlam, near Kentwick. And uh, we didn't really know what we were going to do. And uh, all of this was written under lockdown. The main themes, I suppose, are natural history, the natural world, and how it's imperiled, and uh, also mental well being. Recently, I received a request to provide a poem to be carved into an Eisteddfod chair for Podcall Comprehensive School. I offered, what the sand reveals is not what the sand conceals. Why? Because sand is unavoidable in my world. If they, if they persevere, writers, those sads, obsessives, create their own myth. I believe sand is a feature of my own port call myth. Myth. Other writers, mythic places, a myriad. For me, sand is part of belonging, which is something both learned and inherited. Belonging can be a spiritual condition which might be the opposite of social or cultural alienation, which can also spur or even smother the writer. Literally, my sand consists of the dunes and coastline between the Kenfig and Ogmore rivers, including the town of Portgall. This area encompasses the prehistoric, the post-punk, and the whales falling, fallen over the Brexit brink. All I compose about Portgall contributes to this myth. Musing on, its, musings on its natural history and people, fiction or not, are my attempts to enrich, no, explore that myth. For me, the place names under the sand are crucial. Searching old maps, I feel I am salvaging history from amnesia. These names always reward investigation, revealing other explorers. Part of this writing creates a bestiary of sand 
People are important, but so are conga eels, lizards, roe deer, dolphins. As to botany, I wonder how many flowers have names in two languages that celebrate virgins, vipers, devils, thunder. There is nothing like ancient botany for encouraging superstition, itself part of myth. When I climb Korga Brine, supposedly the second highest dune in Western Europe, below me the tides, if the tides are right, is Tusker Rock. Close by were transport, transported those megaliths that became Stonehenge. And if this is wishful thinking, I don't care. I concoct my own law involving these within the context of history, geology, and climate change. Vikings, the Irish, Barbary pirates, wreckers, thousands of shipwrecks, American GIs, Paul Robeson, the excellence, Italian cafes, and millions of fairground trippers and caravanners have contributed, still, still contribute to this myth. I'm going to conclude my first section of the reading now. And I'm, although I can't see him, I hope he can see me. I'm going to hand over to Christian Evans, who I think will be reading another excerpt, one of his own excerpts from Sand and Snow. Christian. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, I'll, uh, oh. I'll read the, um, I'll just read a couple of sections from, uh, uh, from this uh, piece that's in Poetry Wales. Uh, some people are introduced to nature and the wild by parents or by books, but I fell in love with the natural world as a kid, almost by accident. My kind-hearted, decent parents, a cop and a barmaid, were fighting, shouting, breaking up. It was as if the nest was blowing away around me, and I hadn't yet learned to fly. Feeling betrayed, defiant, confused, I began to run away, roaming the rivers, woods, and ruins beyond the town, anywhere I could drift unseen, and smoke undisturbed the sticky black hashish we all had back then. I found more than peace and quiet and sanctuary. I found miracles, a blackbird tossing leaves and sweet wrappers to pluck a worm from the gutter, then meeting my eye, its whole body a triumphant scowl. I remember the thrill, the shock of a big fox flickering across the frost ahead of me, its breath like mine, a scroll of prayers. I swear, my heart dragged me away, day after day, out into the fields and lanes. I could do nothing about it. School became irrelevant. I quit. So young I was, I wept some days, just recognizing the fugitive lives of the wild creatures, our kin, so frail and fierce, forced as they were to survive on the margins of things. And what if the margins were actually the center? And what if heaven is hiding here in the scrublands and dunes where no roads go? Strange thoughts, dangerous thoughts, but I had nothing to lose. Increasingly, I began to stay out all night shivering until dawn in the wreckage of Candleston Castle or under a bench on Scare Beach, sand fleas in my coat, fingers too numb to roll a smoke, listening to the edges of things creep closer, questioning the difference between the scream of a starving gull 
and the howl of an angel's hosanna. The years go by and you survive falling from book to book, learning to fly, working in factories and warehouses, months on the door, finding the words in Taliesin and Blake, Hopkins and Hughes, and what's this? Minhinik, a poet from my own town. Small blessings, hints and clues. LSD opened a new library, and I was first at the door as often as possible. Ah, Descartes, what a mistake we have made following you. Matter, it turns out, is not fundamental, yet neither is mind. Rather, both together are faces of God, and God is nature, infinite, perfect. One day, adrift among the foreshore dunes, my hands ablaze with melting starlight, I spoke a prayer. What did I say? I don't know, but it was a prayer, and the waves on Kenfig sands were suddenly a singing voice, a chorus. Yes, a chorus of immortals had come. The play stops. I've stepped outside. All is still. The audience appears, biting its tongue. And the chorus speaks. Show me, it says. Show me what I have shown you. And um, I wonder if that's a good point there to hand over to Zoe. Um, and um, perhaps I'll read one more short bit. Um, a bit later on. Are you are you, um, are you ready, Zoe? Yes, I'm just, um, I just might need someone to turn my video on for me because I can't do it myself. Yeah, the, uh, Peter's got control of that, I think. Okay. Um, so can... somebody might need to fix that for me. Or otherwise, yeah. you just have to, oh, hang on, somebody's done it. I was just going to say otherwise, you just have to. Oh, there you are. My, my picture. <laughs> Great. Oh, hello, everybody. I'm so glad to see you. And I'm really glad to be celebrating this piece of writing, which was so fun um, to create. And I always think that it's, um, it's such a joy to write something with other people because most of the time we're doing things alone. And so it was really fun to do this. And please ignore the piles of books in the background. It's very untidy here. <laughs> So I'm going to read my sections and my sections were all about snow. Um, the other two wrote about sand, but I wrote about snow and each section that I wrote was based in a particular winter. And so I'll read those. And uh, the first winter was in 2009 when I first moved to the US. So. The first winter in the US, we are living on the edge of the world, the mountains in Pennsylvania. Most days it is just the snow and me. We don't have any children yet. And every day when my husband goes to long hours at his new job, I sit and think about the baby I miscarried when I arrived, but I can't seem to write about it. I'm surrounded by snow, but I'm reading about sand at home. Robert Menhinnick writing, open quote, an unknown but suspected world, the silken run of sand, once the sea's cold level covered all this hollow place, silence like a great stone rolled over the world, close quote. I cycle into town through the snow, my legs bitten with cold and the silk stockings. Occasionally a bear lumbers into town too, then back into the forest again. Sometimes we meet friends in Zeno's, a cellar bar, and drink cheap beer and dance drunkenly to the fiddle player's tune. Sometimes I give palm readings. Here is a long lifeline. See, two children at least. We talk about everything. Losing my virginity was awful, says one friend. When I ask him why, he just repeats, it was awful. Another friend asks me what love is. I say, I'll never be submissive, but I think love means having to submit to someone. Someone says, 
everybody needs love. And there is so much more of this drunken talk before they throw us out. The pavements are like glass. Someone slips on the ice and hits the back of their head on the concrete. We walk home singing through the night until we part ways. Good night then, good night. And then we are alone, my husband and I, placing our feet carefully on the crust of snow on the field, hardened and icy, the smell of skunk like a brewery on the air. It strikes me then how sad and beautiful the snow is, like death falling down sharply over the mountain town, everything barren and blank, nothing but snow, its powder stretching over everything like a desert, the town like a forgotten city covered by sand. And then the next winter I write about is 2011, which was when my first son was born. I never know love, deep, ecstatic, life-changing love, until the day that my first son is born. For nine months, I pray, promising all kinds of things, if only the baby will survive, and here he is. In those first few months, it is deep winter in America, when the snow sculpts itself to the shape of things, drifts against the front door. The curves remind me of the beaches at home, peppery sand grains, wind blasting the cheeks, sand banks giving way and drifting against sea walls. Perhaps the same wind that here lifts the powdery snow also gales across the Atlantic to shiver the sand on the shore of Wales. I don't even mind that the baby is born in winter and we spend our first month snowed in. I hardly sleep at all. I don't want to write. I just want to look at him. One morning, I lie him on his back in the middle of our bed. A mobile is hanging down and he makes a joyful snatching movement with a tiny hand, pedaling his legs as if that could bring it closer. Out the window, everything is dusted with snow and the trees have grown long, shiny icicles like hard, cold fruit. It was all so incredibly beautiful, the contented baby on the bed, the snow outside molded so carefully to the shape of things, and I want to stop time. I don't think I have ever been as happy as in this moment. My baby and I, we are so close that we know every fluctuation of mood in the other. He's still a part of me, but as with all children, he grows into separateness the journey away from the mother, away from the home that every one of us is forced to make. And then the next year is actually our pandemic winter. So let's just have a look at that. There's nothing like the great silence that falls when snow arrives in American winter. This year, a pandemic winter, smothering snow, not Christmas card snow, not cotton wool or marshmallow snow, but lethal snow, deadly even. It's good to have respect for American winter. I'm thinking now though, not about snow, but sand, a long ago summer at Three Cliffs Bay, when with the tide out, the children ran away on the sand, dancing as the fog rolled in to mystify the beach. Wildflowers were purpling and yellowing, and my bare feet were full of thorns. Sinking into hot sand, it gave way and yielded only as much as I had to give way and yield to as I found a way of moving. There were things I could have said that day, like what I wouldn't give for that baby to have survived, or I wish you would kiss me. But these moments slip by, and so the day closes, and we put on our clothes and go home. The children run out into the garden, scuffing the brilliant white lawn with dirty patches. We throw snowballs. I hesitate to let them play in the garden alone for too long. After all, it's not safe out here. Or maybe it's just that after four miscarriages, I know death intimately. I might be too protective of my children, I might love them too intensely. I know this, so I let them run far out into the snowy meadow, each flash of color in the far distance. And the last one 
the last section goes back to the winter when I was pregnant with my second son, which was 2014. The winter I am pregnant with my second child, I wake to find my breath as icy steam on the air. Even under the covers, I feel the chill. The electricity has gone out overnight and temperatures are below minus 20 degrees C. They call it a polar vortex, a spiral of frigid air curling down from the Arctic. We can't stay here, we have to move. I am hugely pregnant, whale-like is the only word for it. And like the whale in the biblical story, I'm carrying a stowaway. I carry him gladly, selflessly. I leap into action to protect him. My eldest, now a two-year-old, found his way into my bed overnight, his cold little feet pressed up against my thighs. I dress him under the covers, pull a wool sweater over my pregnant belly. We spend that day in a diner, eating pancakes, drinking hot coffee. I whisper sweet things to my baby, just on the brink of being born. Not yet, I tell him, and he stays put. The polar storm reminds me of what lengths I will take to protect my children. The one beside me in the bed in the freezing house, and the one in my stomach that I was about to birth. I wonder sometimes if we need this lesson. When mishaps like this happen, it might teach us that all our contraptions and tech cannot protect us from the weather. And I'm not sure who's going next, but I'll pass it on. Zoe and Chris, thank you so much. Really enjoyed that, really enjoying this essay. Um, I'm seeing more and more in it all the time. I think it's interesting to read it in sections, uh, but we're going to interrupt this essay now for one of our guest readers. There are two guest readers, one in Newport, I believe she is, is Laura Wainwright, and the second input call live streamed here tonight is Jerry Ray. The first reader will be Laura. Uh, I believe Laura's first collection is coming out from Green Bottle Press towards the end of this year or possibly next year. I, I think she'll put me right. And uh, Laura is also part of the collection uh, God Wellion, Shares Horizons, which hopefully will arrive from Parthian in November. October, November, to, uh, I almost said, uh, celebrate um, um, discuss uh, climate change and the enormous Co uh, COP26 conference hand, um, going on in November in Glasgow. Uh, that will have a big climate change theme and Laura Wainwright will have an essay in that. Uh, Laura also writes uh, the Newport Journal for the Sustainable Wales website. Over to you, Laura Wainwright. Thank you, Robert. Um, do I need my video on like Zoe? Or... There we go. Thank you. Okay, as Robert says, I've got um, my first pamphlet coming out um, later this year with Green Bottle Press. So I'm just going to read initially just three poems from that pamphlet. Um, the first one I'm going to read is called The Plough. The Plough. Hawthorn half in flower, a sculpture of wind shreds clear sight of the bay. Beyond, beacons wink on thin, then impasto blue. There's a headland and an island in muffled focus. Could I swim there? 
Water disguises distances. This light is a trick. Yelp of a gull above. The hawthorn points west, I think. I step, look down over ragwort, wild carrot and rock to the shore. Find a horse. Shale grey, translucent as krill. Symptom of storm, fever and dream. A kefil dur. Ears peaked like helical shells, planting its kelp feathered hooves in the dragged sand, waiting again for the plough. Or scythe seren agogled, drowned by midday. Addendum. Here and there I will leave you a sign, something inscrutable, a coincidence, ordinary and aslant, dismissible as news from an unvisited country. No, everything at first will be an omen, your glasses useless in such stumbling light. So lace your stiff boots and put on my coat, always too big. The sweet mulch of me done up to your throat. We saw many autumns, though none in this place. Fabula. There was once a ravenous man from the road who made soup from a stone. I've read you the story every night this week. Our cow careg, a rough recipe, sweet with sprigs and roots, the jostling apothecary of the pot. It's the dupe that gets you the sham magic of a meal you won't eat, and the hope perhaps held in a stippled stone like a lone trout trembling against a chalk stream. The tale I knew took a crooked turn, a nail tossed in a broth of rest. So I hand you a stone Swilled where the water rolls clear. Yours tonight for the journey. Thank you. Three more poems later on from Laura Wainwright. I'm delighted now to be able to introduce Jerry Ray, who's going to read at least two poems, which he's publishing very soon, I believe, in a Welsh magazine called Seventh Quarry. Um, Jerry has published before, but several years ago. So it, he, in a way, is a writer reborn. So welcome in an empty room, Jerry Ray. Yes. Thank you, Ralph, for that introduction. Um, this is the seventh Quarry magazine that Rob was referring to from Swansea. And I have two poems in this edition, which I shall start with. And then I shall read another two poems later on, as Rob has said, which will be published um, at the end of this year, I hope. I write about childhood and nature um, and music. This poem is called A Baritone of Slaughtered Wales. Today I am a cello, bowing longer sounds along the length legato strings to draw a broken heart, a baritone 
of slaughtered whales by Bach. Today I am a violin, perky, plucky, pizzicato on top of the world of trifling matters, a country boy of fiddling trifles. Today I am a terrible trumpet, blasting notes in a stadium of diabolical chance. We have to win in a game or else we fly a honeybee into the bog. Today, I am a triangle or a glockenspiel in a lesson from a teacher pale with music, copying notes into a book I never read. The second poem is called Elements. Snow, a million poems, a million voices, falling flakes, some will stick, some will fade away. Rain, an infinity of droplets caught in a catcher like dreams, sending me to sleep, sipping like a bird. Hail drumming on the stones, a cacophony of icicles, a solo performance swept away. Clouds, gods in the sky, shapeshifters silently moving. My head is still. Rivers, Heraclitus stood here once, observing change. Noticing. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry Ray, who is coming back for two more poems. What a voice. What a voice, Jerry. My the gosh. The, the baritone was <laughs> slaughtered whales. Extraordinary. It's certainly filling the room here. Great voice. It won't surprise you that Jerry is a musician and a noted singer in Port Cole. For the first, although we're not having an, an interlude or an interval, uh, to end the first series of readings, we have two films by Paul Woodford, which will be shown together. And, um, I'll try to see them myself, but uh, I think Paul will describe them. Okay, over to Paul Woodford. Yeah, okay. Hi, Zoomland. <laughs> I'm really pleased to be able to actually present at last these 12 visual poems. Um, they are titled in the same way as a language-based poem or a painting on a wall. And I'll speak these titles as we go. There is no audio, but the poems are not silent. Some shout, some whisper, all of them speak. So, Peter, first group, please. Title, Masks Escaping the Tyranny of the Viewer. This first poem makes reference to the painter Malevich. His pioneering work had a profound influence on the development of non-objective art in all of its forms. A poem used as a lens. This poem asks, who is looking at who and what? Perhaps it's the poem reading the viewer. Perhaps we are looking at the event horizon of a black hole where there is no transaction.
a poem that measures the understanding of the viewer on the Kazimaya scale. We are back thinking about Malevich and that tension between the sanctioned ways of seeing the entrenched traditions of art and whatever it is or wherever it is that art is going next. A poem about the uncertainty using measured tones. This muted poem plays with the anxiety caused by a work that refuses entry by lyrical means. However, it is playful. It is just a fictive envelope. And yes, the ghost of Malevich does reside here as well. Two poems engaged in a private conversation. In this poem, the viewer is reduced to the role of eavesdropper. But perhaps what is really being talked about is the role of intertextuality when making sense of this stuff. This poem demands interactional synchrony. Start with the breathing. This final poem takes a different tact and invites us, well, insists that we form a more existential bond with it. So, breathe in, breathe out, <laughs> breathe in. So the next group of poems um, have a different feeling about them. They are definitely less forensic and intended to be open works in a sort of Umberto Eco sort of way. A poem thread. Perhaps we immediately think of Ariadne's thread but there are many myths that involve thread. I would prefer to think of Philomena, who having had her tongue removed to stop her speaking of her violation, sat at her loom and wove her story into the fabric so that her sisters might understand. Territories. During these COVID, this COVID time, we all become aware of the territories delineated for us. So here are some, here are three thoughts about territories. Maps are an abstraction to fit a territory onto a conceptual grid. Territories are spaces delimited by fixed confines. Territories are at one time and the other inclusive and exclusive. Unsettled, a scenic poem. This poem is unsettling because you feel it could snap into a recognizable form at any moment. But the scenic writing is wordless and semantically open. It sits between expressive mark making and the invention of language.
carrier to noise ratio, ratio expressed as a poem. Although square brackets are used to denote a closedness and brackets in general are used to contain groups, this poem disturbs that function. We are crossing codes, taking a sign that is expected to be unambiguous into an area of deliberate ambiguity. Equivalent, equivalent. We are in the same space as the last poem. The title is written as equivalent. Equi, we all understand. Valent or valency is a term borrowed from chemistry describing how atoms combine or are displaced when forming compounds. So perhaps a metaphor for an alternate form of se semiotic operation. This last poem simply comes with this title. Lift the turf, reveal the sky, blue sky, thinking, out loud, disturbing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul Woodford. Wonderful. These are Paul's biz, biz bows a word he didn't use, I don't think, in his description. A marvelous word, bispo. I'm going to continue with this essay, Sand and, uh, so uh, sand and Snow. Today, we cannot write about the natural world unaware of man-made weather. The most minute detail of poetry is thus politicized. Such knowledge becomes part of the mythification of place. Where does this originate? Partly from Decima Minhinik, my mother, 94, 95 in November, who inherited the family's paranoid schizophrenia and instills in her twins a love of literature and curiosity about the natural world. In poetry, I have made two attempts to describe her schizophrenic life. You named the constellations as they swung over our heads, fuzzy balls of galaxies pulsing in a glass, the Milky Way's fine spider web. It's only now we understand. You have been looking away from us for a long time. Also, recent writing describes my visits to her care home, which is picked and caught near Port Cole. And I quote, miraculous morphine, its consolation like the sword of Orion, you showed me 
a girl with stargazy eyes pointing to brick red beetle juice. It's dazzling azimuth. No, never not an astonished I knew. And that must have been when I looked up first. End quote. The unexpected also plays a part as the greater world encroaches on the smaller. Hurricane weather and economic upheaval attract human migrants, sunfish and Portuguese men of war. And something else, for me at least, unmistakably real and yet mythological, Maybe the new poem below is an image for my mother's condition. Monstrous, tragic, beautiful, a part of that bestiary and integral a sand to my consciousness. This is the poem the title of which I have a great deal of difficulty in pronouncing. The title is Alleged Autobiography of a Sorby's Big-Nosed Whale found near, Scare, found near Scare Point, South Wales. And what commences the poem is the grid reference, uh, the Old and Serbia reference for Scare Point. I hope my next book, my next collection of writings Will contain, will contain lots of these old and survey references. Uh, I won't uh, go through the tedious process of uh, reading this one, but it, it actually does begin the poem. Alleged autobiography of a Sorby's big nosed whale. I rose hundreds of feet, a rumor, then a legend that lowered itself into a limestone vice. When washed ashore, a tractor hauled me down the dram road to be rendered. My flukes, my ingots of fat, the green and goosebeat rostrum, eating my pale lice running out of the sun, whale lice get sk daddling over scare. The gulls in penance on the sea, at last abandoning their prosecution. Wild, this whale, perplexed by parasites or the brine in my brain pan. At, at 11 tons, only a stripling, yet a secret stranger and unchronicled. No page apparatus exists in, this, in the encyclopedias as if I was waiting for the world to catch up. Yet did I dream a boy carving his name into my vast and velvet hull? Thank you. Uh, that's the end of my reading tonight in the green room uh, on live stream and also uh, on Zoom, but also uh, over now to Zoom where Christian Evans, I hope, is getting ready to read something and he'll hand over to Zoe Brigley and then we'll have Laura and Jerry and maybe Paul also. Not Paul, I'm, I'm talking. Okay, Christian Evans. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, I was tempted to stay invisible. Um, but, uh, change is good, I think. So I'll read um, the final section uh, of my contribution to the Poetry Wales piece. And then I'll read... Um, uh, a poem, um, uh, and then I'll hand over to Zoe. <clears throat> the winter of 
2013 was ferociously cold. Ken Fig Pool froze over completely. For the first time in 50 years, dawn found me standing at its edge, a voice daring me to walk out as if weightless over the locked deeps into the smoky light. How far could I go? I took a few tentative steps, paused to listen to the ice creak. If I fell, who would see? The water rail, evidently. It came tiptoeing out of the cover of the reeds across the ice towards me as if I wasn't there. Odd little bird with mousy wings and shoulders, long red lips, a soft gray belly. Was I invisible? I stood still, watching it creep further into the open. Every couple of steps it pecked the dirty ice, like an old man finding his way with a cane. Closer and closer, tap, step, tap, step, right into my shadow until I could hold my breath no longer and it saw me and was gone. The spell broken. The sham. That's what they call the cry of the water rail. Up close, a startling shriek. But from a distance, there's a background note too. A quivering bass string. As if the sham resonates underneath somehow, elusively, yet assuredly, through the black marsh water. One voice, really, though you'd be forgiven for thinking there were two. And the last piece for me tonight, um, before I hand over to Zoe, will be um, a version of a poem by the Spanish poet Lorca, um, this is one of his um, one of his gypsy ballads. Um, it's not an accurate translation. I've 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 um, I've adjusted various bits of it, but um, it's a um, poem for the archangel Saint Michael, who uh, whose feast day is um, celebrated with carnivals and um, and all sorts of different ways, of course, around the world. So this is called Saint Michael. <clears throat> From balconies you see them go, mules and the shadows of mules, uphill, uphill and uphill, laden with bales of sunflowers. In the shade, their eyes are milk with the weight of night, the elbowing air a crackle of dawn like a lick of salt, a sky of mule spirits, white sky, closes its quicksilver eyes, a gift in the gloaming where the heart finds peace and all the water is ice locked away from our lips. Uphill, uphill and uphill where water is wild and free. Saint Michael on his tower in a coat of lace, and covers for the lanterns his long golden thighs. Domesticated angel, finger to the number 12, performing an anger of feathers, of nightingales. Boy of a thousand nights, Saint Michael sings in the stones, far away from wildflowers, his skin sweetened with cologne. The sea creates a poem a dance of balconies. The mudlarks of the moon find voices in the reeds. Flashy girls arrive, chewing sunflower seeds, their bodies concealed lazily with loose knots. And tall horsemen come, and mothers with lonely eyes in the echo of yesterday's songs. Desire bristles on their skins, but the nightingales have gone. And here's the Bishop of Manila, with saffron pollen in his tears. So poor, so poor, and witless and blind, he speaks a two-faced mass, but no one gives it any mind. Saint Michael on his tower keeps every secret. His petticoats rustle 
with ribbons and sequins. Saint Michael, King of Kites, Lord of awkward sums. Turmoil, clash of shutters, laughter of strangers. Thanks very much, everybody. And I'll hand you over to Zoe Bridley. Hi, everybody. Um, so for this like second part of the reading, um, I decided that I was going to actually read something that I've never read before, um, which is a story um, that was published in the American magazine Waxwing. And I'm going to put the link in the chat for accessibility in case anybody needs that. Um, and the story is called the woman who loved a bear. And I'm not gonna tell you anything more about it than that. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but just the beginning. The woman who loved a bear. Let us begin with a lovely woman, Dolorosa, the youngest daughter of a poor family, a girl rumored to be cursed with silence. It starts when she is a silken haired child so quiet that her parents have to bend their ears down to the soft mouth talking. One day, Dolorosa stops speaking, and before long, she never speaks at all. The villagers begin to think then that there is something odd about her. Dolorosa lives with her grandmother in a tumble-down cottage on the edge of town. She has a mother and father and two sisters, but when she stops speaking, she is sent to grandmother. As the oldest crone of the village, grandmother will sit on a stone by the cottage gate and tell a story if passers-by will listen, especially if they give her a coin or cup of ale. Often they ask for the story of Dolorosa's curse and she tells it all. Dolorosa, when she was just a baby, was left in the pram one hot afternoon. Here, under the summer stormlight, the baby cried and something grey with wings flew into her mouth. As she tells the story, grandmother points out the birthmark under Dolorosa's left eye, which is evidence enough for some people, along with her silence. She will never be able to love, says grandmother. No man should go near her, for if they do, she will only harm them. She will not mean to but she will. And no man in the village ever does go near her. Dolorosa has never loved a man, so she isn't sure if what grandmother said was true. How do you think I have reached my great age? Grandmother asks. I'll tell you, by staying away from men. Dolorosa likes living with grandmother, although the old lady fusses and frets when Dolorosa so there's some type, type, well, there's some type, type of there in the actual manuscript, I mean, so let me start that again. Dolorosa likes living with grandmother, though the old lady fusses and frets, but fate has a way of playing tricks on them. And so it was that even cursed Dolorosa could not stay hidden forever. The first suitor is a soldier camped near the town. Dolorosa is outside the church. Dolorosa doesn't attend church services herself, but waits outside patiently for grandmother. The young priest recently arrived in her village, says that Dolorosa's gazing bothers him. And indeed, when she gazes into the far distance, like she is somewhere else, people around her shift uncomfortably in their pews. How at once she is so far away, but can see through them all. Why must you embarrass me, grandmother asks. You were sent here to, to me to live down your shame, but despite your silence, you can't help making a spectacle of yourself. If silence could be speaking, you would be shouting. But Dolorosa would not stop dreaming, so now she waits outside the church, sat on a gravestone in her buttoned-up green dress and shawl. The soldier does not go to church either because, he tells himself, 
he does not fear God. When he rides by on his horse, Dolorosa is sat on a gravestone in the churchyard, and he sees her only as a ghostly white face and flaxen hair, her head wrapped in green silk. The face reminds him of an owl in a thicket. He stops to talk to her. She points to her mouth and shakes her head, but he doesn't seem to mind her silence. He talks incessantly, tells her of all the battles he has won, all the campaigns he has fought in. I have captured giants. I've overthrown ogres. When he finishes his bragging, he tells her that though she is odd, he has taken a fancy to her. I can't say I understand it myself, he says, after all the beautiful women I've had. Dolorosa gazes at the soldier. Of course, she says nothing. He accuses her then of laughing at him, throws her down on the grass among the headstones and shoves his hand up her skirt. Dolorosa is mustering courage to find her voice and cry out when the soldier is lifted up and off her. He is thrown against the wall of the church and knocked out cold. The shadow of a great white bear falls over her. The bear is standing over Dolorosa. It bends its muzzle down to her face where she lies on her back on the wet grass. The stench of bear breath blasts her. Its head is so close that she can look into its small dark eye. Then with a swift movement of its massive body, it leaps away. She watches it amble into the forest beyond the churchyard. She wonders if she will ever see such a magnificent animal again. But soon the days pass and the bear too is forgotten. The second suitor is a scholar visiting the village priest. Because Dolla Rosa never enters the church, the scholar has never noticed her, nor has he heard the rumors about her. And it comes as a shock to him when on one of his bracing walks in the woods, he finds her bathing naked in a pool. Grandmother does not approve of Dolla Rosa's swimming. I know where you are stealing off to, she calls, as Dolorosa runs out into the forest. It used to be her and her sisters, but now her siblings are all married off to prosperous farmers and they cannot get away anymore. Dolorosa doesn't want to be like them. Grandmother is cross though. Will I be saddled with you until I die? Grandmother asks, although secretly she sounds pleased. Dolorosa waves grandmother's pleas away. Dolorosa does not speak, but with her hands, she is saying, Oh, grandmother, please, why waste your time bothering me? I'm happy as I am. And she is happier still when she has a chance to slip away to the pool. In the deep part of the forest where the vines twine lazily, past the glade with a hollowed out tree, she visits the blue pool and lets the cool water lap over her skin like silk. By some unhappy accident, the scholar stumbles into this place where Dolorosa stands naked in the pool, combing the water from her bronze hair with her fingers. The scholar calls her Venus, Proserpine, Psyche. He calls her his true love. Dolorosa simply climbs onto the bank to retrieve her clothes, puts them on hurriedly and turns for home. The scholar starts to follow her through the woods. Dolorosa doesn't run. She just walks on doggedly while he follows her all the way to the cottage. She enters the garden and he doesn't dare go further and all his sweetness turns to bile then. He calls her cruel, coquettish, sly bitch. He is still standing there speaking this poison when she goes inside and closes the door behind her. Grandmother looks up from her knitting. I said you would get into trouble. Dolorosa wonders if the scholar will tell what he saw, expects a dressing down from the priest, but she is worrying needlessly. That evening, the scholar never returns to his quarters. In fact, he is never seen again at all. The third suitor comes on a night when it is raining, the wind like a sharp intake of breath around the eaves of the house. Dolorosa is waiting for grandmother to, turn, to return home. She is sitting alone at the table with her meagre supper when there is a knock at the door. 
she opens up to find a great white bear stood on its hind legs, its fur wet and clumped in the storm. It lets out a long growl and without knowing why, she asks if it would like to come in. It falls down with a thump to all fours to pass through the door and then once inside rears up again, its head brushing the ceiling. The bear has come, of course, for Dolorosa, as creatures do in stories. I'll just stop there and pass on again, I think, to Laura. Um, I'm just going to read um, two more poems. Um, these two are set in um, my home city of Newport, South Wales. Um, the first poem was written for Sustainable Wales, a Mr. Squad, um, or Our Square Mile, now, um, as Robert said, um, Gorwellion. Um, this is Leisure after W.H. Davis. Up here, cars call and leave like fed birds, engines chorusing, waiting for dusk or deal, for text, touch the cloud cleared tump or tongue to run along a paper edge, a cupped spark, the green musk of hills. Days that have been Diesel, salt and vinegar trade wings licking this ridge, its contusions of height and tide. Victorian toilets selling flat whites now and on November 5th this whole wide sky a smoky, disobedient display. So stop and stand or sit a while. Don't stare too long another grateful captive of this view. Let the M4 crawl, see the tramping ramblers, the phantom tracks of sleds. Mark the memorial benches where the city's dogs lay their own bouquets. I hope this last poem will be part of a forthcoming journal entry for my Newport Journal for Sustainable Wales. Um, this is focused on um, a park in the city um, established on contaminated land close to the M4 motorway. HC. HC grows roses round her door. River roses, burgeoning in audacious sprays, shouted shapes. HC, insignia of an intersection imagist, stealthy as the evening usk between motorway lights, caught in the drift, the uprising mud, her half empty canisters rattling like the HGVs crossing concrete bridges overhead. HC, I'm sorry, this mural is mine. Your school book hearts and pink stars paint you in my head when it is day. The sun is warm and I know nothing in this place is as it seems. These lush airbrushed fields are palimpsests too. Their stories meters deep. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Zoe and Christian. Uh, Christian and Kenfig, uh, Zoe in Ohio. Um, Laura in Newport, and now in Port Call, two more poems from Jerry Ray. Uh, I imagine, I think they'll be submitted, or they might be even appearing in the winter issue of Seventh Quarry, but 
he'll put me right about that. Jerry Ray. Thank you very much, Rolf. And, um, and yes, uh, I think it's in this winter's. It might maybe next year's January's um, publication, certainly very soon. <laughs> and these are the two poems. I write about childhood, I write about nature, and I write about poetry and music. This poem is called String Theory. Kite, a fiddle for ancient folk, the guts of goats spilling onto the floor, possibly a Welsh word for who knows what. In the slaughterhouses, the cows huddle into the shadows. I remember once a piece of string a thousand miles long with my father on the other end, unable to speak into the cup or hear those strange vibrations. Cat gut, kit gut, submucosa for guitar strings, stretched intestines, scraped with a fat knife. I put my thoughts into my pocket for half a century or more and pluck the strings for blues and jazz guitar upon the floor where I rest my body now and lay in the blood of slaughtered animals, no suture to stem the flow. This next poem is called Regard the Falling Tides. The roosting seabirds on the gravel pits regard the falling tides and the huge moon in the night sky. Adorn a ballet of swirling catches, seek oyster and mollusk in the wet sands, muddy to the foot and lugworms that coil like letters in a pit. Who am I to call above the spindrift, the watery cuneiform of a wave? Lapwing on the wetlands, the overlapping of space and the scribble of dim tides. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Gary Ray. Thank you, Laura Wainwright. Thank you, Zoe Brigley, Christian Evans, and Paul Woodford. Um, especially for Zoe's idea of the essay that became Sand and Snow. Uh, both Christian and I were delighted to be invited to write part of that and uh, listening to it now, I, I, think, I think it worked. Thank you for coming to put call to the green room. Hopefully we'll be able to do one of these things in real time with real people before the end of the year. Who can say? But for now, Jochamar, Tanatronessa, Salong. <laughs>